First of all, I would like to thank the organizers for the opportunity to talk about some aspects of cooperate physics that have not been discussed so far at this conference. I would like to acknowledge the NSF and the National High Magnetic Field Laboratory for their continued support of our research. Uh, the experiments at the Magnet Lab have been done by my former and current graduate students and postdocs who are listed here. We studied both single crystals from Takao Sasagawa in Japan and MB grown films from the Brookhaven group. We collaborated also with Christos Panagopoulos, he had theoretical support from Vlad Dobrosavljevic and Lara Benfato in Rome on different aspects of these studies. So the main questions that we would like to understand are the nature of the insulating ground state at low carrier densities in strongly correlated two-dimensional systems and the behavior near the quantum phase transition from that insulating state to a conducting state, a metal or a superconductor as a function of doping. Cuprates, of course, are just uh, one example of a broad class of materials that belong in this category, and the emergence of high TC superconductivity from a doped multi-insulator has been a central issue in this field. Several speakers have already uh, mentioned various relevant uh, issues, such as quantum criticality, role of disorder, various competing disorders have been mentioned, uh, vortex matter physics may play a role, and so on. So what we are interested in is the behavior of the charge degrees of freedom. We want to know what the doped holes do. So we also measure the transport, but we also include time-dependent measurements which provide information about the dynamics, charge dynamics in these systems. So far we have focused on lanthanum-based cooperates, and we focus on the regime of very low doping um, in order to address the questions that I uh, just mentioned. So we focus on lightly doped non-superconducting samples and highly underdoped superconducting samples. So all measurements uh, are actually in the, near the multi of regular limits. All measurements are done at very, very low temperatures. So I will describe uh, the results of several studies, which, uh, so the first one will be the results of, uh, of the experiments that probe the nature of the insulating ground state. And uh, those experiments established that this state is a charged cluster glass. Then I will discuss the doping-driven transition from that insulating state into a superconducting state. In many experiments, as you have heard over also in the previous talk, uh, magnetic fields are very commonly used to probe uh, various properties of these materials. However, many uh, basic questions have remained open. So in order to address some of them, we also carried out a study of the magnetic field-driven super transition from a highly doped superconducting state here into the insulating state as a function of the field. And at the end of the talk, I will also discuss the, the behavior in the zero field, the superconducting transition as a function of temperature. Now, strictly speaking, this is not a transition to an insulating state, but in order to understand, to get the full picture of what is going on in this uh, regime of low doping, it is important to understand the behavior as we vary all the relevant parameters. So I will show you some very recent unpublished evidence that as we approach the transition from above by lowering uh, the temperature, uh, we see the emergence of some dynamical heterogeneities near the transition. So uh, many speakers, starting from the very first uh, talk of this conference, have discussed the uh, bad metal behavior in cuprates. So rather than make uh, my own slide, uh, I actually took a slide from Yoichi Ando's talk about more than 10 years ago, which summarized this behavior. So basically the point is, uh, one of the points is that this uh, metallic behavior at very high temperatures emerges already with the first added holes. It's seen already at 1% doping, and uh, in response to one of the questions, there are no features here at this nail temperature. Uh, he argued that I think the multi offer limit is here when rho is of the other one. So that this metallic behavior, uh, as many people have believed at least until the previous talk, uh, is that the metallic behavior is observed for resistivities that are way too large for a 2D metal. Also, it was, uh, has been known uh, from uh, many years ago that when these underdog cuprates are placed in very high magnetic fields, uh, this uh, 
an, an underlying uh, insulating behavior is revealed. And uh, this emergence of insulating behavior takes place when the resistivity of the system is too low for it to be a 2D insulator. So basically, uh, uh, his point was that these systems are not just bad metals, they're also bad insulators. So our measurements, our studies are done like here, at this very edge, at very, very low temperatures, probably below all of these measurements. And uh, he argued that uh, these features could be understood in terms of some kind of electron self-organization, in particular the formation of stripes. Uh, so that same year, uh, Christos and Vlad uh, published a paper in which they analyzed the uh, various, all the experiments that were done on cuprates and argued that they, they could be understood in terms of uh, this kind of phase diagram where uh, the ground state at very low doping is uh, a charged glass insulator, some kind of a cluster or stripe glass, which is separated from a homogeneous metal metallic ground state at the highest dopings by some kind of a intermediate inhomogeneous phase, which is obviously conducting, but also glassy, a form of a bad metal. So this work really was a motivation for our studies of the uh, ground state in this regime. So we have established, and as well as other people, at least in uh, lanthanum-based cuprates, that this state is a charged glass insulator. So the spin degrees of freedom form a spin glass phase, but we are interested in, in what happens at low temperatures. We want to know what the holes do. So the experiments that uh, probe this insulating state could be the, can be divided into three groups. The first one involves studies of the fluctuations of the resistance with time. Uh, there were also history-dependent transport measurements and dielectric measurements by, done by other groups. And all of these experiments agree with each other and they indicate that the ground state is a charged glass insulator. So the experiments were done in this uh, intermediate regime where this long range antiferromagnetic order of the parent compound is already suppressed, but it is known that some short range antiferromagnetic order persists. In particular, uh, such that dog holes occupy regions beyond, uh, I'm sorry, regions between uh, these uh, hole poor antiferromagnetic domains. So, what the, so the studies were done at very low temperatures, deep inside this pink glass regime, practically on this horizontal axis, so that this magnetic background is frozen and we can detect what the charges do. So I'm going to describe briefly uh, the kind of information that one can extract from the noise measurements. Uh, I will not have time to discuss any of this in detail. So we start with the 3% doped LSO, uh, which is in that intermediate regime, and the spin glass transition temperature is 7 or 8 Kelvin. Uh, we saw in the previous talk that at very high temperatures, uh, the resistivity exhibits Fermi liquid behavior, but when you go to very low temperatures, below a few Kelvin, we see, you see 2D variable range hopping transport. So the system is localized, and the holes are localized, and Something happened to the colors, but anyway, uh, so these are some measurements of the relative fluctuations of the resistance with time for different temperatures, and the curves are shifted arbitrarily for clarity. So basically at high temperatures, above about 200 millikelvin, the noise is uh, Gaussian. However, as you go to lower temperatures, below about 200 millikelvin, noise becomes increasingly non-Gaussian, as you can see better on this on this plot here. And know that these are some very long time scales, uh, more than 10 hours, so clearly there are some fluctuations that take place over several hours and there are also more rapid events. Non-Gaussianity of the noise means that the noise looks different uh, depending on the measurement time window. In other words, uh, in a given experimental time window, different states contribute to the measured resistivity. So that in other words, on the experimental time scales, the system does not have enough time to spend the entire phase space. In other words, again, it is uh, non-ergodic or glassy. This can be seen easily uh, simply, well, from here, I think, but if you want to analyze the statistics, you can uh, uh, look at the probability density functions of these fluctuations, just make simple histograms. You will see they're non-Gaussian, and moreover, their shape depends on the measurement time window. 
Uh, when you have a time series, it is also common to look at the power spectrum. So we find in general that it is a 1 over f type. And this exponent alpha is shown here with the red symbols as a function of temperature. So as you reduce the temperature, alpha increases to values larger than 1, about 1.4. So what this means is that the spectral weight is shifted towards lower frequencies. In other words, the dynamics of the system slows down as temperature decreases towards zero. And large values of alpha greater than one also reflect the underlying, the increasing non-Gaussianity of the noise. OK. Um, so when the noise is non-Gaussian, you can extract non-trivial information also by looking at the higher order statistics. You can get additional information from that analysis. And one statistic that, is, uh, that has been used commonly is the so-called second spectrum. It's a fourth order statistic. Uh, this is the power spectrum of the fluctuations of the first spectrum of, at a given frequency with time. So without going into details, because I don't have the time, uh, the second spectrum is, in general, a 1 over f type. So if the noise is Gaussian, you, you always get contributions from the same state, same fluctuators. Uh, you will always end up with the same value of the power spectrum. So this exponent will be 0. There will be no frequency dependence in this uh, second spectrum. And when uh, the noises or fluctuators are correlated, then this exponent is greater than 0. So basically, this is a measure of correlations. And we have, um, so this exponent here is shown uh, here with the red symbols as a function of temperature. So again, we see as the temperature is reduced below about 200 millikelvin, uh, the correlations increase and become very large. Also, we, uh, we established that none of the noise statistics depend on the magnetic field or the magnetic history which strongly suggests that the observed glassiness is due to the charge and not spin degrees of freedom. Also, the gradual increase in slowing down of the dynamics, the onset of the correlations, suggest that the charged glass transition uh, takes place, strictly speaking, at zero temperature, similar to the studies on 2D Coulomb glasses. Now, this second spectrum has been used in the past, uh, uh, first by Michael Weissman in the studies of conventional metallic spin glasses, in order to differentiate, to distinguish between two rival theoretical approaches. So based on the argument that he developed, uh, we find that our results for this uh, second spectrum, this frequency dependence that we observe, is actually consistent with the generalized picture of interacting complex, compact droplets. This is a picture that relies on the existence of short-range interactions. Now, we know that holes do interact with the long-range Coulomb interaction also. So this suggests that this kind of uh, stripy, clustery glass that we observe uh, may result from the competing presence of competing interactions on different length scales. We have both short-range and long-range. And it is um, interesting that uh, Jörg Schmalian and Voliness uh, uh, found that in a model appropriate for cuprates that included competing interactions in different length scales, they found that uh, the emergence of uh, this kind of a striped glass, even in the absence of disorder. Uh, here I would like to note that uh, in systems where uh, with only long range interactions, uh, metallic spin glasses, also 2D Coulomb glass, uh, this kind of behavior is not seen. The second spectrum was, uh, is totally scale invariant. So it is a really a sensitive probe, uh, sensitive way to distinguish, good way to distinguish between those, these two approaches. So, OK, so we established that the charges are glassy at low temperatures. And in that same regime where we see this, we also see history dependent hysteretic behavior in transport itself. Here is an example of the hysteretic behavior of the magnetoresistance. We also found that there is a difference between field cooled and zero field cooled resistance. So, since, so our goal next was to investigate the evolution of this charged glass state with doping as we approach the transition to a superconductor. And since noise is difficult to measure and this is easier, I would not say easy, uh, we used these two types of experiments uh, to detect charge glass in his, uh, the evolution of this charge glass as a function of doping. So that study was done on a series of mb grown films. Uh, here is the temperature dependence of the resistivity, and I marked the 
multi-offer egg yield limit. There is nothing unusual here, I think, at low temperatures. So, and these, these four samples are not superconducting in, at all experimental temperatures. These three obviously are. And in all four samples, we found evidence for charged glass behavior as I, such as of the type that I mentioned on the previous slide. So you may note that the temperature dependence in these two uh, samples at the lowest doping is uh, very strong. And in fact, it fits very well 2D variable range hopping. But for these two samples that are very close to the transition to a superconducting state, the temperature dependence is weaker. And we established that the reason for that is that uh, uh, there are superconducting fluctuations developing that are present already on the insulating side of this transition. So we established that also from the magnetoresistance um, in a way that's been used by other groups. And it's similar to what uh, Nevin was describing. Basically, you put high enough fields, suppress superconducting fluctuations, and reveal the normal state uh, where uh, magnetoresistance uh, is proportional to the field squared in the low field limit. Uh, interestingly, even though you know, this is, uh, strictly speaking, on the, these samples are insulating, uh, we observe this uh, kind of behavior, as you can see here from this plot. And from here, you can also calculate the contribution of superconducting fluctuations to the conductivity from the measured resistivity and from the normal state resistivity that is extrapolated from high fields as shown by these dotted lines, if you can see them. So we can put all these together in a phase diagram as a function of doping. And note that the low temperatures are at this end of the plot. So we want to focus on what's happening at low temperatures in the zero temperature limit. So as we increase the doping, we see that this charged glass behavior is suppressed uh, until we reach this uh, bulk superconducting state, this uh, superconducting dome shown with this dark blue, as this dark blue region in the XT plane. However, as I mentioned earlier, already on the insulating side of the transition, we see the emergence of superconducting fluctuations. And this is, in fact, consistent with the so-called bosonic picture for 2D superconductor insulator transitions. We also found evidence that these superconducting fluctuations uh, compete with this charge glass behavior. So some of the, those localized holes are starting apparently to form pairs. So the onset of this doping driven transition is influenced by the presence of this uh, competing charge order. Okay, so what I want to do next is move on to the superconducting side. So we'll be looking at highly underdoped superconducting samples. And so we'll fix the doping, and we want to see, again, what happens in the zero temperature limit as we increase the magnetic field. Uh, so as I mentioned, uh, people have been using magnetic fields for decades to study uh, properties of cooperates, but many questions remained open. In spite of all these measurements, for example, there has been no evidence for uh, scaling associated with a quantum phase transition uh, from a superconducting to the insulating state. And in fact, even in conventional 2D superconductors, the question of the magnetic field-driven superconductor to insulator transition is still open. For example, one of the key issues is whether this transition is direct or it involves some intermediate phase. So in order to address these issues, we performed the detailed magnetoresistance measurements over a very wide range of fields and temperatures. And we chose samples that have very low TC. Uh, the resistance goes to zero at about four Kelvin. And samples were grown using different methods. So even with this such a low TC, we still had to go to very high fields. In one of the samples, we had to go over 30 Tesla to suppress superconducting fluctuations. So uh, we found evidence not just for one, but for two quantum critical points. We found very nice scaling, and I have no time to show you this. Uh, so what I will do is just show you a sketch of the phase diagram that uh, is made based on our results. So here we have a temperature on the vertical axis, so, and we are interested in the ground state, you know, what happens at zero temperature. So basically we found evidence for two distinct superconducting phases. One where TC is not zero, it decreases with field and it goes to zero at the first quantum critical point. And there is a second superconducting phase, which strictly speaking is a superconductor only at the zero uh, temperature, in the zero temperature limit. 
And at the second quantum critical point, we have a transition to the insulating state. So we find uh, still close enough to the transition. In this insulator, there are still some superconducting fluctuations. So this transition is also consistent with that bosonic uh, model for 2D superconducting insulator transition. So our finding of two distinct superconducting states is actually consistent with earlier studies using different types of measurements both on LSCO and other coup rates that found uh, at higher temperatures a transition from uh, uh, between two different uh, phases of vortex matter, Bra glass and the vortex glass. So, um, so here, uh, when by applying the field, we destroy this Bra glass phase. So this criti critical point here is related to the melting of this pinned vortex solid. And here we have a vortex liquid, which uh, apparently because of the influence of the disorder at low temperatures, freezes, becomes sluggish, slower, and freezes at zero temperature, and this is why the system is a uh, superconductor. So, uh, the, so the scaling associated with this quantum critical point actually dominates a very wide range of parameter space, wide range of temperatures and fields, and we believe that this uh, might be relevant for the interpretation of other experiments where people apply high fields because very often there are debates whether phase fluctuations are important or not. So this scaling actually at low fields fails at temperatures below a line similar to the one that this dash dotted line shown here. And this is known from other experiments to be uh, due to be the result of thermal fluctuations. This is due to the thermal melting of this vortex lattice. And this is in fact consistent with general theoretical expectations where in this regime you expect that thermal fluctuations will dominate. So now we want to, you know, we go back to zero field and ask what happens as we change the temperature. Of course, a lot of people have studied this and one motivation for these studies has been uh, to investigate the extent in temperature of superconducting fluctuations and the nature of these fluctuations. So, so we have, um, okay, and uh, we can do that again, as I showed before, from magnetoresistance. So these are now the data for this superconducting sample. In the same way that I showed before, we can uh, determine the field and temperature beyond which we no longer see superconducting fluctuations in the measurement. So in this particular sample, uh, at temperatures that are higher than uh, 50, about 15 Kelvin, when superconducting fluctuations are still relatively weak, we find that this normal state resistivity obeys this Fermi liquid behavior, but we are interested in the regime where this breaks down, in the regime of lower temperatures. So that's what I will talk about. And we, we have done studies for two samples, for this one that I just showed you, and another one, 8%. So they are highly underdoped. Uh, so here is the temperature dependence of the resistivity for uh, this sample in the regime where Fermi liquid behavior is no longer observed. So I don't have time to talk about this, but we have also done uh, unpublished, you know, we have unpublished results soon to be submitted. Uh, results of the paraconductivity studies and uh, current voltage measurements that uh, provides strong evidence that this transition is of the 2D berezinsky kostelitz tauless type. In other words, the transition occurs by thermal unbinding of vortex-anti-vortex -vortex pairs. And uh, the results uh, are in good, uh, even the quantitative agreement with the theoretical, relatively recent theoretical work on the BKT transition in layered superconductors. So we find that phase fluctuations uh, are, dominate the regime of only a few Kelvin above the temperature resistance goes to zero, the BKT temperature, and above that we see 2D Gaussian fluctuations. So what I want to do at the end is discuss our study of the dynamics uh, in this regime as we approach the superconducting transition. So we measured, again, the resistance noise, and uh, the, it was measured in this a regime of temperature shown here as this rectangle, and this is actually the data for the sample with higher doping. This is the sample structure, which was chosen this way to eliminate various spurious effects. So anyway, here are the relative fluctuations of the resistance as a function of time at several temperatures. 
Uh, again, now uh, I'm sure we can tell that the noise at low temperatures is non-Gaussian. Again, we have very long time scales, some very long events, but we, there are also some switching, some very rapid events and everything in between. Uh, the power spectrum, again, is of one or F type. As shown here, we can see that there is also strong temperature dependence. And in order to look at the temperature dependence in more detail, we fix the frequency and look at this power spectrum as shown here with these uh, black symbols as a function of temperature. So for comparison, we also show with this red curve the temperature dependence of the resistance, which here goes to zero. So this is the BKT temperature. So basically, we see that over this very narrow range of temperatures, uh, the magnitude uh, increases by many orders of magnitude, practically exponentially. At the same time, the exponent alpha of the power spectrum, uh, which is one in, at the highest temperatures where Gaussian, we have Gaussian superconducting fluctuations, then it starts to increase and it saturates to value about 1.4 precisely in the regime where these phase fluctuations dominate in the BKT regime. So the dynamics again uh, seems to be uh, slowing down. And again, precisely when phase fluctuations become dominant, we see the onset of non-Gaussian noise. So the noise changes character, the dynamics changes here when phase fluctuations become dominant. So this exponential increase um, of the noise uh, may reflect the exponential divergence of the correlation length of this transition. If you do the analysis of the second spectra, uh, we get a result that is similar to what I showed you earlier. So there is evidence that there is some kind of characteristic scale here in this system. There are some interacting domains, clusters. So one is led to speculate that they may be also due to some competing interactions on different length scales. It is also tempting, uh, okay, so the important thing here is that we measure the noise also on a sample with lower doping, which is more disordered, but we find that this non-Gaussian noise is substantially suppressed there. It is seen only very close to the BKT temperature. So this tells us that this non-Gaussian noise that we see is not due to disorder. Um, something happened to all this. Okay, so another thing that is tempting to speculate about is whether this these dynamical heterogeneities that we observe may be due to, may be, may be due to dynamic stripes that many people have been wondering about, but it's not obvious to me why they would become observable only when in the regime where phase fluctuations dominate. Why not at high temperatures? One can also speculate whether these dynamical heterogeneities perhaps reflect the underlying uh, intermediate bad metal phase that uh, that I mentioned earlier that was proposed by uh, Christos and Vlad. But at this um, time, we are not really sure. <laughs> so, and I see I went very fast. Uh, so these are basically the conclusions, in fact, the summary of the work. So I showed you some evidence, and I think we've established this definitely in lanthanum based cuprates, that uh, insulating state is a charged cluster glass. As you approach the, transition, the superconducting transition, some of the, for, some of the holes start to form uh, localized Cooper pairs, and the onset of the transition is influenced by this competing charge order, which is a characteristic of the insulating state. At zero field, we found evidence for the BKT transition that I did not have time to show, and also evidence for the emergence of some dynamical heterogeneities. In the, so in the field-driven case, we found evidence for three distinct phases. Uh, in the, at the highest fields, uh, we didn't have enough field uh, to go deeper into the insulating state, but years ago there were experiments by other groups on the same material and similar or same doping where they found evidence that uh, this was also, uh, they, the resistivity obeyed to the uh, mod variable range hopping. So I think I'll stop now and thank you for your attention for staying until the end. <laughs>